Hey guys, today I want to talk more about muscle contraction and I wanted to focus on the force that a single muscle produces when it contracts or when, when it's stimulated. So imagine that you took a muscle and you were to remove it from the body, like a muscle of an animal or something, remove it from the body and um, you were going to hook it to a device that you could stimulate the muscle and measure how strongly that muscle contracts. I actually taught a lab where we did just this, just that, we would take the muscle of a frog and we would dissect out the, the gastric anemias or the calf muscle of that frog and we would hook it to a device that allowed us to stimulate that muscle and measure its force. We would euthanize the frog first, right? So, um, so imagine you're gonna have this like device that is attached to the ground, okay? So imagine here's like a little device that comes up, a little pole, and it's gonna have a little hook attached to it right there. Then attached to this hook, that's where you're gonna have the muscle of the frog, so that the muscle of the frog is gonna extend up like this, and it's going to be connected through that hook, okay? Now, the muscle, even though it's been removed from the frog, it's still living tissue. The frog's not alive, but the muscle still is. Okay, so I'm gonna kinda outline this, so that's gonna be the muscle of the frog that kinda comes up like this and around, okay? Now, um, the other end of the muscle is going to be attached to another hook, which is going to be located right there. And that hook is going to be attached to a device called a load cell. That's what this little square represents. Um, this little blue square is what we'll color it. And the load cell is literally just a little force transducer. It measures how much force um, is, is, or how much force is being exerted or, or pulling on that load cell. Okay, so in this load cell, it's gonna be attached to the ground like that, all right? So, what will happen, and then, oh, and then finally, what you'll have is you'll have a little electrode, which is a little wire, which extends through the belly of the frog's of muscle, and then that allows us to deliver a shock through this little electrode, that's what this little lightning bolt means, and this shock stimulates the frog's muscle, causes it to contract, it pulls on these hooks, and the load cell measures how strongly that muscle pulls. Okay, so um, now I'm gonna create a little graph over here. This graph is gonna measure the force that that frog's muscle produces as a function of time. So here you're gonna have force, and then on the bottom axis, or the X axis, you're gonna have time, which goes like that. Okay, and then let me label this. This is our load cell right there. And then this is obviously the muscle. Right there. Okay, and then the wire, that's the electrode. All right, so now imagine that we were to hit that, that muscle with a I don't know, let's say we're gonna hit that muscle with a small little one volt shock. Okay, so that's what this little blue line down here represents is the, the strength of the shock that simulates the muscle through the electrode. So let's say we hit it with like a little tiny one volt shock. Okay, so let me label this, this is one volt. Okay, right there. That's gonna stimulate this muscle to contract, um, but the key point is, it's not gonna stimulate the muscle to contract right away. There's gonna be a little bit of a delay in time from when that muscle is shocked to when the force that the muscle produces starts to increase. And that short delay is called the latent period. So here we're gonna have this force, okay? Right about here, that's when the shock hit the muscle, it's not gonna contract right away, there's gonna be a little bit of a delay, but then the muscle is gonna produce force and then relax, okay? And then this little short duration, which is really only a couple of milliseconds in time, that's called the latent, latent, L-A-T-E-N-T, can't write, latent period, okay? And the reason that exists is because it takes time for all those steps that we talked about in the other lecture to occur, okay? So um, the neurotransmitters have to be released from the, um, 
the, the nerve, the uh, acetylcholine has to diffuse across the synapse, the neuromuscular junction, right? The new signal has to be um, tr uh, kind of uh, transmitted through the sarcolemma down the T-tubules, calcium has to be released onto the sarcomeres, and then finally those actin binding sites need to be exposed. All of these steps take time. Not a lot of time, but it does take time. A little delay and that's called the latent period. Then force goes up and then it goes back down. If we were to then shock the muscle with a stronger shock, let's say like a five volt shock, all right, we're gonna hit it with a much stronger kind of signal. What do you think that would do to the strength of contraction? Well, do you think it would go up, down, or stay the same? Well, it turns out that when you hit it with a stronger shock, first off, what's gonna happen to the latent period? Is that gonna be the same, shorter, or longer? Well, the latent period is going to be the same because the latent period is always the same. Doesn't matter how strongly your muscles want to contract, the latent period always exists, and you can't get around that, right? And that's why our reaction time. Like we can tell our muscles to contract as quickly as we want them to. We want to react super fast. Let's say you're like a, a I don't know, an Olympic sprinter. You want to start moving right after the starting gun goes off. There's going to be an inherent delay that you can't get around, and that's due to the latent period and the time that is required for the signal to travel down the nerves and all that stuff. Okay, so the latent period's gonna be there, but then the force of contraction is actually gonna be stronger, okay? The reason the force is stronger is not because this frog is like, oh, ow, I'll produce more force because you shocked me with a bigger shock, right? This tissue is alive, but the brain is no longer attached to this muscle. It's because that electrical signal spreads out further throughout the shark frog's muscle. With a one volt shock, it's only going to stimulate a couple of the muscle fibers that are really close to the electrode. A couple of muscle fibers contracted at the same time produces a little bit of force. As you contract, hit it with more and more um, electricity or a bigger shock, that shock or that voltage is going to spread out further throughout the frog's muscles, stimulating more muscle fibers. More muscle fibers pulling in parallel produces more force overall. And this is the same thing that happens when how you control how much force your muscles produce. It's related to this idea called a motor unit. So, let me draw a little picture here. Um, let's say we have a motor nerve. This is a neuron that's delivering a stimulatory signal to some of the muscle fibers in your muscle. Okay, so here's a single motor neuron. And a lot of times, or in most cases, this motor neuron is gonna branch and it's going to innervate a series of different muscle fibers, not just one. So, this is a single nerve that branches and innervates I don't know, in this case, one, two, three, four, five, six different muscle fibers that are, let's say, positioned in one of your muscles, okay? So these are like, you know, muscle fibers that are like in your biceps muscle. When this signal travels down this neuron, it branches and it's gonna cause all these muscle fibers to contract. All of these guys together is called a single motor unit motor unit. I literally cannot write. Let me try that again. Motor unit. Okay, good. And the more strength you need to produce, the more motor units are uh, stimulated. Some motor units only innervate a couple of different muscle fibers. Those are gonna produce just a little bit of force, like if I wanna lift this pen. But if I wanna lift something super heavy, like a big dumbbell or something, I'm gonna need to stimulate much more motor units. And the motor units that are uh, kind of capable of lifting a lot of force, they might branch out into thousands of different muscle fibers to produce a whole lot of force, okay? So the more force that a muscle needs to produce, the more motor units are stimulated. Now let's imagine that we hit this muscle with a series of one volt shocks like this. What will happen here is that the force goes up just like it would at the beginning. It goes down, but when you hit it again, it goes up some more and then up some more and it might keep going up we've been able to achieve higher force with a series of one volt shocks than we did with a big five volt shock. The reason this happens is because the calcium of the sarcomeres or among the sarcomeres keeps building up and building up. After calcium is released when this muscle is stimulated, that's gonna cause the muscle to contract. It's gonna cause those cross bridge cycles to occur. 
Then after contraction occurs, all that calcium gets sequestered back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. It gets pumped back in there. That's why force goes down. Well, when you hit it with another shock before all that calcium has been, calcium has been sucked back up, it's gonna release more and more calcium into the, the, the sarcomere, which causes the force to go up and up and up and up. Eventually it's gonna plateau, and that's what would look like if we did something like this. Let's imagine that you know we this muscle were to relax back down here. And if we were to hit it with like a very rapid frequency of shocks, let's say something like this, where there's not much time in between the different shocks, then the contraction would go up and it would plateau. That plateau is called tetanus. Tetanus. And that's because all of the available calcium has been released and all the cross bridges that are available in those sarcomeres are cycling. Or all of the myosin heads are grabbing on because all the calcium has been released for that series of muscle fibers. Okay. Um, this is, you know, you might uh, remember the, the, the tetanus is, a, is it also a condition that's caused by a bacteria, which um, Clostridium tetani, I believe, I might be off on that, um, but this is a condition when a bacteria infection from, it's a common bacteria in the soil, we have a vaccine against this, so it's not a problem. But this um, infection affects the spinal cord, and specifically it's gonna affect inhibitory motor neurons, which tell the muscles to relax all the time. It shuts those motor neurons down so that the muscles are no longer receiving that inhibitory signal, or that signal telling them to relax, 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 relax. And that causes all of your skeletal muscles to contract maximally at the same time, causing all of them to achieve um, tetanus. The result of this is a horrible condition where your back arches up, your jaw is locked, literally your muscles are contracting so hard it's pulling the tendons off of the bone. Um, and, it, and it's just a devastating disease that is uh, it's really great that we have a vaccine for it. So um, that's about it, okay, thanks.